Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jim Lom with Electronic Data Solutions. I work out of our Portland office, and I'll be conducting the webinar this morning. Uh, this concerns the Tremble mapping for GIS with a centimeter product called the Centimeter Edition GO7X. This unit also happens to have a built-in laser rangefinder, and it can be used either post-processing or it can be used with a VRS or a single base station. So I'm going to put everybody on mute, and then um, don't forget to ask your questions at the end of the session. Okay, a little bit about our company. Uh, we're Electronic Data Solutions. We've been in business for 26 years, and our specialty is helping people come up with an integrated system that allows them to collect field data um, with mobile computing products in the field. We offer a very wide variety of hardware and software, and everything that we offer uh, comes with technical support, uh, optional training, and certainly repair services. Our home office is located in Jerome, Idaho, which is in south central Idaho, and we currently have eight regional offices uh, with 26 employees total, and you can see the location of our various offices here on this map. So let's talk about the new Trimble GO7X. It was announced by Trimble in early November last year. It began shipping on the last business day of the month. People began to see it. We began providing demonstrations in early December, and uh, it has really enjoyed some wide acceptance due to the fact that it does have the built-in laser rangefinder. So this particular unit does have a certain appeal to folks that have been using GPS with an external laser rangefinder. Everything is now combined into a single product. The nice thing about this unit as well is that it does include a cellular modem and Tremble was nice enough to include a modem that was universal. So this cellular modem could be activated either on AT&T or on Verizon. So just for sake of explanation, the GSM-style modems are AT&T, and the CDMA-type modems are Verizon. It does have 4 gigabytes of onboard data storage, and you can put up to a 32 gigabyte storage card in the SD card slot for a total of 36 gigabytes of onboard storage. This unit also has the fastest processor of any of the Trimble Geos ever released. So whatever software you're, you're using is going to respond very quickly on the screen. And the final thing about this product is that you can get the submeter version, the decimeter version, or the centimeter version. And no matter which one you start off with, you can upgrade that same unit all the way to the top of a centimeter. Now today we'll be discussing the centimeter unit because we're finding out that a lot of folks that are collecting data for GIS, especially if you're in the water industry, in any way, shape, or form, are demanding better elevations. And this product will produce incredibly good elevations. Something that's interesting is that it is a multi-constellation receiver. What that means is we're not just picking up the GPS satellites, which are United States, of course, but we're picking up the GLONASS satellites, which are Russian. We certainly can still receive signals from the WAS correction satellites over our country, but this also picks up the European Galileo constellation. And there are anywhere from 8 to 10 Galileo satellites in the sky right now. It also picks up the Compass system, which is Chinese, and that's sometimes referred to as the Bidu system. And then finally, the QZSS is Japan's version of the WAS correction satellites. So it picks up all those different satellite constellations, providing you with an excellent real-time accuracy. Even if you're not getting a real-time correction signal, you're still able to get anywhere from 17 to 23 satellites when you're out there in the field. This new product also has something very special called SBAS Plus. SBAS refers to a satellite-based augmentation system, and the plus part of it means that if you have WAS turned on in this country, in other words, you have the WAS feature turned on inside of this unit so that you can receive approximately one meter corrections from the southern sky, uh, your Russian satellites do not disappear on the sky plot any longer. 
And what that means is that our WASP American satellites are able to apply corrections even to the Russian and the Galileo and the Compass satellites. So pretty nice. You can't talk about the Geo7X without talking about the sensors. And of course, the sensors that we're referring to is the laser rangefinder, which provides distance, the clinometer, which provides vertical angle, and then finally the compass, which provides horizontal angle. So it's very important to understand what the errors are in those sensors so that when you're collecting data um, and you're collecting an offset point feature, that you're aware of what kind of errors you could be imposing on the final resting place of that point feature. So the laser rangefinder is incredibly accurate, and it's good to plus or minus two inches. That's actually five hundredths of a meter. Um, and it will shoot to any object uh, to about 400 feet. And that may seem like a short range compared to other lasers that you've used in the past, but the reason that is so critical is because the compass has a one and a half degree horizontal angular error. And if you can imagine taking a shot from point A to point B 200 feet away, that one and a half degrees um, error will increase as the distance is, goes farther away from the laser. So the farther your shot, the more error you'll have out at the end of that measurement. So it's important to understand that these are the error factors in this. If you use a reflector like a piece of survey glass or a bicycle reflector or a piece of reflective tape, uh, the laser can actually shoot out to 650 feet. And the inclinometer, of course, measuring vertical angle will actually transfer elevations from one point to another as well. So what's interesting about the laser rangefinder, it uses the built-in camera. Now, of course, the camera has been used in previous models of Trimble receivers to simply add a photographic record to a feature that you're currently mapping. But in this particular case, the camera itself acts as the sighting device for the laser rangefinder. Because I know many of you watching this webinar are probably thinking, how in the world do I accurately point the laser? And that's a great point. So Trimble has decided to turn the entire screen of the GO7 into the sighting device for the laser. So you're essentially using the camera along with the laser. So basically, here's what it looks like. If you take a look at the screenshot, um, this is actually the laser utility that you activate. And it's actually using the entire screen. And you can see that at the bottom, you've got a range, a bearing, and an inclination. And as you move the red dot around on the target, you can see a dynamic updating of those measurements. So in other words, if you turn the unit to the right, you would see the bearing go from 186 to 215. If you pointed the laser down, you would see the inclination go from 8 degrees down to minus 4 degrees. So it's actually got a dynamic updating. Um, the red dot appears on the target. And we've done some experiments with this, and we've discovered that you can be 200 feet away from a speed limit sign, and it's very simple to see that red dot. And the reason that's true, of course, is because the sign has a lot of reflective paint. But when you're pointing at a tree at 200 feet, the red dot disappears simply because there's no reflectivity in the tree. But the good news is you can see the tree trunk right in the camera itself. So you're looking at the screen you can confirm that you're pointing the red dot at the tree, and then you can finally take the measurement. Now, there's two different ways to take that measurement. You can either press the camera button, and actually, uh, this is sort of an older unit that I'm showing you. So that camera button, which is located right here, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse arrow, but that looks like a laser. So you press that button to take the shot, or you can use your stylus and you can tap the little laser symbol at the bottom of the screen to take the shot, either one. If you like that measurement, then all you have to do is either tap on the check mark, which is in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, or you can press the dash button that's located directly underneath that check mark. I've had some experience with using this laser in the last couple of months, and I've discovered that for my taste, it's a lot easier to take the shot and then save the shot uh, by using the buttons rather than having to pick up the stylus. So whenever you're using a laser rangefinder or any kind of an external sensor that's actually taking measurements, 
and potentially adding error to your final point feature, it's very important to understand the total error budget. And this is a phrase that's pretty important. Um, let's say if you're using the GO7X one centimeter unit, you're starting with one centimeter of error in the GNSS system. And that's the Global Navigation Satellite System, or the GPS unit in this case. Um, the laser has a built-in error of plus or minus five centimeters. That's just under two inches. You've got error in the clinometer, and you've got some error in the compass. So the bottom line is, if you're actually using a one centimeter unit, it's extremely important to keep your distance shots as short as possible. Now, how do you check the sensor accuracy. This is really important because if you've got a one centimeter unit, you're obviously very concerned with high accuracy. So in this particular case, this is what we recommend. You can then use your unit to hold the antenna directly over something like a fire hydrant as an example. And the reason we like to use fire hydrants as an example for this test um, is because it's something that's easy to see. Uh, it's typically got shiny paint, which means the laser is going to give you a good return. And uh, it's something that if you stand 100 feet away, you're still able to see it easily. So hold the antenna over the fire hydrant, collect a point feature. So now you've just directly observed that hydrant. Then stand 25 feet away, collect another hydrant, but this time shoot it as an offset. So then you would simply activate the laser, you would put the red dot on the hydrant, you would take the shot, and it would accept that. You would say, OK, you're done. Then stand 50 feet away and do the same thing. And then stand 100 feet away and do the same thing. Now, obviously, if you had zero error in all the sensors, then all four of those point features would be on top of each other. But as you can imagine, there is some error in these sensors. So you'll see four different fire hydrants, hopefully fairly close together. But by doing this simple test, you'll be able to look at the data on a map and you'll be able to see which fire hydrant or which symbol on the map represented the greatest error. And you'll typically find that the farther away you are, the more error you'll have in that, in that measurement. So the bottom line is, when you evaluate these errors and do this simple test, the, the question you have to ask yourself, can I live with this level of error? And you know the thing to do, of course, is if you're taking shots that are 20 feet away, you'll do much better than if you're taking shots that are 100 feet away. So good, good way to, to check all the sensors. So because you're dealing with sensors, uh, you do have to calibrate these things once in a while. And the nice thing about this, there's a great sensor calibration utility built into the GO7X, which allows you to actually calibrate the clinometer and the compass um, all at the same time. And it's something that I can't show you here, but it's something that should be performed once a day. Uh, you should do it outside at your project site. You should not do it in a building. You should not doing, do it standing next to your vehicle. Uh, because when you calibrate a clinometer and a compass, uh, naturally large metallic objects will have an effect on the compass and give you false readings. So it's important to be sort of out there away from large metallic objects. Uh, it only takes about 90 seconds to calibrate. And so you can do this every morning before you start collecting data. And sorry, guys, you can't be shooting the laser from the seat of your truck. You do have to get out of the vehicle and, uh, and take your shots. For something as large as a traffic control box, um, a truck, a vehicle of any kind, any kind of a large metallic structure, like maybe a, um, an electric tower out on those high-tension tower lines, then you should be a minimum of 25 feet away just to give you some idea. So how come we're talking about GPS and GIS and centimeter all in the same sentence? Uh, the centimeter accuracy uh, formerly has been in the realm of surveyors. And that makes a lot of sense, because surveyors are highly educated, and they're very well versed in the measuring sciences. And because a centimeter is such a finite measurement, it's very important to know exactly how to achieve that and to be convinced that you're getting accurate data. And what we found in several different industries is that in aerial photogrammetry, LIDAR projects, 
uh, more precise staking where you have to actually navigate to points and pound a stake in the ground and you want that to be a straight line. And more recently in the water industries like public utility districts and uh, public works departments where they have water departments, uh, people are really concerned about getting decent elevations as well. So the accuracy that you can achieve with this particular unit, and by the way, you will be using the Zephyr Model 2 external antenna, which is a survey grade antenna, you're able to get one centimeter horizontal and one and a half centimeters vertical. So it's pretty powerful. Um, a typical survey RTK system, and RTK stands for real-time kinematic, which simply means survey on the move, uh, they're approximately twenty-five dollars to $28,000, so they're very expensive systems. The, the same accuracy, or almost the same accuracy, in a mapping system in the Geo7x centimeter is about sixteen five. So there is a huge difference in price between a survey system and a mapping GIS system capable of virtually the same level of accuracy. One of the reasons for this, by the way, is that surveyors are getting more sophisticated hardware. They're getting a receiver that can achieve down to five millimeters of accuracy, which of course is half a centimeter. They've also got built-in radios sometimes in the rovers, and they also get very expensive software programs that mapping and GIS people simply do not need. And an example of that is uh, a least squares adjustment program. Uh, the ability to lay out and design a sophisticated survey control network, things that basically mapping people don't need. And so that's one of the reasons for the huge difference in price. Uh, this one centimeter accuracy horizontally can be achieved either in real time, if you need to know where you are right now as you're standing in the field, or you can do it post-processed. And because many of the states in the country, there's either 12 or 15 states in the U.S. that now have something that we call a VRS, which we'll talk about in just a moment, you're able to now pick up a signal, uh, typically through a cell tower, and you can achieve these incredible accuracies right in the field. So the centimeter level, as I say, is becoming more popular. The nice thing about getting a centimeter um, accurate position with this particular system is that you can collect data the way that GIS wants to see it. And what that means, of course, is you can collect data on a tree, you can record the species, the condition, the diameter, um, you can record the drip line, you can record all sorts of things in addition to taking a photograph. In the case of a hydrant, you can record the fact that it's a hydrant, the color, the brand name, the serial number, the condition, the number of ports, and then, of course, a photograph. And these are things that survey software simply does not permit. So you do have all the GIS capabilities, but you're sort of merging or matching that with survey grade accuracy. Uh, the Trimble has floodlight technology, which is the ability to, number one, pick up the Russian satellites. Number two, there are algorithms built into floodlight technology that automatically smooth out lines when you're collecting line features, and they smooth out the perimeter around area features or polygons when you're collecting them. Uh, in addition, floodlight includes an electronic barometer, and the electronic barometer is built right into the hardware, and of course a barometer measures barometric pressure, and when you get a barometer reading and you couple that with the geoid model, that is built into TerraSync software, you're able to actually calculate extremely accurate elevations. Many of you that have used GPS for quite a few years are probably aware that the vertical accuracy compared to horizontal is typically two to one or three to one. So if you had a one meter mapping system, you would conceivably be getting two to three meters of vertical error. Well, those days are gone if you get the Geo 6000 or the Geo 7, because both these new sophisticated receivers have that built-in barometer. And if you're using TerraSync software, which you must do when you're collecting one centimeter, then you're able to get that incredible vertical accuracy, which is virtually identical to the horizontal. 
So TerraSync provides for faster and simpler data collection, and it's a very familiar workflow. Um, so I've got a polling question for everyone. And let me take a moment and bring this polling question up on the screen. This question is, how much would you benefit from using a laser rangefinder to collect points? So let me launch this poll. You should see it on the screen in just a moment. And then if you have a couple of seconds here, take your time and, um, and select your answers. Once everybody has answered the questions, then I will share the poll with everyone so we can see what those answers were. Okay, looks like we have about 75% voted here. Let me, um, let me close this poll and I'll share it with everyone so you can see what it said. It looks like we've got uh, about uh, almost a fifth of you are saying, yeah, use it all the time. 44% uh, quite often and even 33% somewhat often. So that's really a very high percentage of people who consider that they could really use a laser rangefinder often enough to possibly justify having a unit like this. Great, everyone. Thanks very much for taking the time. So let's talk a little bit about a VRS. Um, VRS technology has been around for quite some time, several years. But because VRS or virtual reference stations require so much infrastructure, um, it took quite a few years for many states in the country to gear up to have enough stations on the ground so that this would become a reality. So here's what a VRS actually is. Uh, and by the way, for those of you attending from the state of Oregon, Washington, Utah, Ohio, Florida, and many other states, uh, VRS is a reality in those states. There's also small pockets of California that have this as well. A VRS is uh, typically a series of many, many survey-grade antennas and survey-grade receivers. Uh, every one of these units is placed uh, on the ground or on a building where it's safe, and they're considered to be known points on the ground. Now, in this example of the slide, you're looking at three stations. The state of Oregon has about 90 of them, and the state of Washington has approximately 105. So there's just a tremendous amount of these stations out there. So what happens is all these stations are receiving data from the same satellites. They're all collecting their data 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they're all streaming their data to a central computer. Um, the computer in Oregon happens to be located in Salem at the state capitol. And so when you're outside with your unit and you're collecting satellites as well, you're looking at the same satellites, you're using your cellular modem to get onto the internet and you type in the IP address of this particular computer that's storing all this data. As soon as you connect with the server, um, you are sending a raw position from your unit to the computer. The computer now knows where you're located, and it begins to customize a base station file and sends it to you. But let me ask you a question. How accurate is the position that you're sending the computer? it's probably good to 20 to 25 feet. And that's considered to be autonomous accuracy. In other words, that's the accuracy that any receiver will provide you if you apply no corrections to your position. So the base station thinks you're right about there. And if you guys are aware of this, there's something in GPS called the baseline error. And the baseline error says that for every kilometer of distance between the base station and the rover, you add approximately one millimeter of error. And that's called a one ppm error. In other words, a one part per million error. So what this means is if your base station was 100 kilometers away, then you would add 100 millimeters to your final solution, which would add an entire meter right? Or would that be a decimeter? Anyway, you'd be adding error to your solution. So the VRS thinks you're right there, and it begins to send you a correction file 
And because the base station virtually is only 25 feet away from you, there's virtually no error whatsoever added to your solution. So if you're inside the network of a VRS like this, you're able to walk around anywhere inside of that network, in this case the state of Oregon or the state of Washington, and you're able to then get incredibly high accuracy in the field. So that's the value of a virtual reference station. As a side note, uh, it does cost $1,900 per year to receive this signal in the state of Washington. It happens to be free of charge in the state of Oregon. And each state has their own policy regarding this issue. So another big question, where can I get one centimeter of accuracy? Um, if you're suspecting that you cannot get one centimeter in the forest, you're exactly right. And the reason that's so true, if you've ever talked to a surveyor who's using GPS technology, they will tell you that they have to have somewhat a clear view to the sky, at least for a couple of minutes, to be able to get down to this level of accuracy. Uh, the reason it's so important is because these survey type receivers are what they call carrier receivers. And that means that the antennas are actually counting how many carrier wavelengths there are between every satellite in view and the antenna on your pole. And as soon as that count is interrupted by trees or buildings or mountains or other objects, that counting has to begin all over again. So it's usually impossible, usually impossible, to get one centimeter in the woods. However, it might be possible to get a centimeter in a clearing and then use the laser rangefinder to take the shot remotely. You do have to have the external antenna. Uh, the Zephyr Model 2 antenna is a survey grade antenna, and that is required for the one centimeter horizontal, one and a half centimeter vertical. Trimble does recommend that on your very first point, they do recommend a two minute minimum observation time. And the reason they do that is because you're giving the receiver time to make that carrier wavelength count. Now the good news is, if you can achieve that count in a couple of minutes on your first point, you can then store that point and say OK. If you can maintain contact with those satellites as you walk to your next point of observation, then you have that accuracy instantly at your second point, your third point, your fourth point, and so on. It's only when you interrupt the view to the sky by walking next to a building, walking underneath a bunch of trees, that you have to put a little bit more time in on the next point. So here are some of the options for getting good corrections. Uh, as we said before, you can get a VRS correction, which is really a network correction. And L1, L2 is GPS. G1, G2 is the Russian GLONASS system. Um, you can also use a base station, and if you're using a single base station as opposed to being inside of a network, then you have to be no farther than 30 kilometers from that base station. That's approximately 18 miles. So if you're using a single base, you have to be fairly close to that base station in order to achieve that level of accuracy. Uh, you can receive these real-time correction messages through a lot of different data streams. These are data protocols. And TerraSync software, which is the software that you'd be using inside the handheld unit or inside the GPS unit, uh, supports all of these protocols. And of course, there's another option, and we'll talk about this at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can use the Intuacom RTK base and Pacific Crest radio to achieve these. So we'll talk more about that in a bit. So what kind of software can you use in your unit to collect this high accuracy data? Uh, some of you may be using ArcPad, some of you may be using ArcGIS Mobile, some of you are probably using TerraSync. Um, Esri software, which in this case would be ArcPad or ArcGIS Mobile, does not support the collection of one centimeter data. And that makes a certain amount of sense because Esri is a database management company. They're not really a field GPS company. So Trimble has the necessary algorithms in the software. The software can contain that very important geoid model that allows you to actually achieve these high accuracies in the field. So you must be using the TerraSync Centimeter Edition software. 
You can use ArcPad or ArcGIS Mobile to achieve 10 centimeter accuracy, which of course is four inches. So if you're looking to get something other than a centimeter, you can certainly use any program that supports the decimeter accuracy. So what about horizontal vertical? We've talked about this already. TerraSync is the only program that uses this geoid model. A geoid model is a model of the Earth based on gravity readings. The current model in Pathfinder Office and in TerraSync is called Geoid 12A. That's for the year 2012. And it happens to closely mimic mean sea level. So when you're collecting data with GPS, you're actually collecting height above ellipsoid, or what they call HAEs. Um, that geoid model allows the software to look at that height above ellipsoid and instantly transform it to a mean sea level elevation. ArcPad and ArcGIS Mobile do not contain that model. A little bit about the accuracy. Um, you can see that if you're using the Geo7X and you're using the internal antenna, you can still get a remarkable three centimeters of accuracy just using the handheld all by itself. And that's both in real time or post-processed. Uh, if you add the tornado antenna, you can get down to two and a half centimeters. And if you add the recommended Zephyr Model 2 antenna, that's when you get down to one centimeter. So you have to have the hardware built into the Geo7X, and you have to use the right antenna in order to achieve these levels of accuracy. So here's our second polling question. This question is, obtaining one centimeter of accuracy would allow me to do what? So take a look at some of those choices. Take a few minutes to answer that question. Okay, looks like we had about the same amount of people voting. Let me close this poll and I will share it with everyone so you can see the results. Uh, about 11% say provide a better product for my clients. That's a pretty generic answer, which makes a lot of sense for most people. Uh, provide control for LiDAR projects. Um, you know, we kind of require this too. I mean, it's interesting to respond to contracts. If you're used to responding to GIS contracts only, but now you have the ability to respond to a contract that requires much higher accuracy that could technically improve your revenue stream. Uh, almost half of you have said all the above. That's good. And about 11% said none of the above. So thanks for taking the time to answer that one. Let's go on to the next one. Um, a little bit about the radio system we talked about in the Intuicom RTK base. One of the issues, and I know you guys have been thinking about this during the entire webinar, how do you get real-time corrections in the middle of nowhere? I mean, there's no cell towers. There's no Wi-Fi. Um, you don't have a satellite system in order to get it that way. How do you get real-time corrections? There's a solution that uh, we've come up with, uh, with a couple of different other companies. And one of them is to have a Pacific Crest radio connected to your GPS receiver. So this radio would be mounted on the pole with your unit and your antenna. And it would be picking up a broadcast frequency from this thing called the RTK base. Let me go back just for a second. There we go. Um, this radio is waterproof. It's extremely rugged. And it broadcasts over a band that requires an itinerant frequency. And we can refer you to companies that will help you obtain the FCC license in order to operate this legally. And this is going to be receiving data from a device called the RTK Bridge. And the RTK Bridge is a little blue box, and you have to make the decision early on whether you're going to be using it with AT&T or Verizon. So it does require that it picks up a cell phone signal. But here's something very interesting. This RTK Bridge is able to see a cell signal that your phone cannot see. In other words, the signal is so incredibly weak 
that when you look at your phone, you can see you have no cell service. But when you look at the antenna that's highly sensitive on this RTK bridge, and you look at the bar reading on the screen, you can see that it's picking up a cell signal. So here's what people do. They'll plug this unit into the cigarette lighter of their vehicle in order to get endless power. Uh, they put the box on the dashboard of their truck, and they put the antenna on the outside of the vehicle parked up on a hill, because that's where this signal is able to be picked up. And then once that cell signal is picked up, it can be rebroadcast from this RTK bridge up to a mile and a half away to the Pacific Crest radio. So by doing this, you only have to have one data plan for the carrier because the data plan is built into this RTK bridge. And you could theoretically have five or six crews out working on a single project, each of them having a radio connected to their GPS unit and each of them receiving a real-time correction signal from this RTK bridge. So it's a way that it, it doesn't solve all the problems, but it's a way that in very many cases where the signal is so weak that you can't use a portable hotspot or you can't use your smartphone, this may be the correct solution. So here's a gentleman in the field. He's out there doing surveys along a power line and in this case he's decided to mount the RTK bridge on a little tripod on the ground and then you can see the Pacific Crest radio mounted just underneath the GPS unit on the pole and then here's a little closer look so you can get a better view of what they look like. Um, the small antenna is picking up the cell signal, the larger antenna is rebroadcasting that signal out to the radio. So here's our last polling question. We're just about ready to wrap this up. Um, if, I used a one if I used a one centimeter mapping system, I would do what? So take a look at this. This is our last question. And then we'll open this up for some questions. Something interesting about using a single base, too, everybody, is that the GEO7X is picking up uh, the main GPS and GLONASS constellations. It's ideal if you can pick up a base station signal, whether it be VRS or whether it be a single base, that is also receiving GPS and GLONASS signals. And that way you're taking full advantage of every satellite that your rover is able to see. Okay, looks like everybody's voted. Let me close this and share this with everyone. You can kind of get an idea of what the audience is looking for. 38% would rely upon real-time corrections. That typically means you're working in a more urban area or at least an area that provides cell service. 25% rely on post-process corrections and 25% two of the above and 13% all those solutions, which is great. Something you should know, if you can't get real-time corrections, um, then the post-processing software can post-process that data that did not get corrected in the field. So you have a couple of solutions there for your final solution. Okay, so let's open this up for questions. Uh, it'll take me just a second here to unmute everyone. So give me a moment. I have to unmute everybody manually. And if you don't mind, if you have me on speakerphone, um, it would be great if you could take me on speakerphone just because of the feedback. Okay, I've got everybody unmuted. Anybody have any uh, questions or comments? Okay, um, if you think of something, just chime in. Um, the last slide here is our contact information. 
Uh, these are some of the folks that work in some of our remote offices, so depending on where you're located, uh, we can refer you to the right people. Uh, my sales area is the state of Alaska, western Washington, and western Oregon. So if you're located in other places in the country, uh, you can contact me by email or telephone, and I'll be more than happy to refer you to the right person within our company. Um, in the meantime, one more opportunity. Anybody have any comments or questions before we wrap this up? Okay, guys, I guess not. Thanks very much for attending. I appreciate it very much. Um, make a note of my telephone number if you want to talk offline. I'll be happy to answer any detailed questions you may have. Thanks very much, and have a great day.